Okay, they closed off. All right, hello everybody. Hello. Welcome to Animal Presentations. My name is Quinn. I'm a zookeeper here at York's Wild Kingdom. How's everyone doing today? Yeah. Good. Good. Nice. Nice. Uh, so how our animal presentations are going to work is I'm going to bring out four different species, three of which you won't find anywhere else in our zoo. Uh, two of them are going to be from the tropical rainforest, so we're going to bring them out on our rainforest side. And two of them are going to come out on our savanna side because they are from the savanna. They'll come out, they may do some foraging, which means uh, looking for food. They may interact with each other. I'll uh, give a couple uh, bits of information about them, and then you can ask questions at the end. And at the very end of the show, you can come up and take a closer look and take pictures and ask me more questions if you want. Uh, and the last thing before we start is York's Royal Kingdom is strictly a hands-off zoo. But what that means is we want to keep our animals as natural and as wild as possible, because one day uh, our goal is to reintroduce these animals back into the wild. So that means we don't go in with our animals, we don't teach them tricks, uh, we don't train them to do anything, uh, we don't hand-raise them because we want them to be uh, behaving naturally. So we really want to make them natural wild animals. Is there any questions before we get started? All right, so we're gonna start on our rainforest side. And this is our ring-tailed kawadi, or kawada mundi. And uh, he's from Central and South America in the rainforest side. And can anyone guess what his closest relative is? I'll give you a hint, his tail gives it away. Raccoon. Raccoon, exactly. So he's a member of the raccoon family, along with an animal called the kinkajou, if you know what that is. And his role in the rainforest is dictated by the fact that he is an omnivore. Uh, does anyone know what an omnivore is? What, what's an omnivore? Plants and eats plants and meat. Yeah, it eats both plants and meat. Yeah, you said that too. Uh, they eat both plants and meat. So these guys, they love to eat fruit, but when they eat the fruit, they don't just eat the meat of the fruit like we do. They eat the husk, the stem, the seeds, all of it. And what he does is when he eats from a parent tree, he'll make, uh, he walks a couple miles away, he poops out that seed, and actually he plants that tree. And uh, scientists have found that coatis are really, really important for reforesting uh, the rainforest after it's been clear cut, like in the Amazon. Uh, also, they're, uh, they eat the meat too. They like to eat tarantulas, spiders, scorpions, nasty things that really could be potentially dangerous to the people that live around there. So uh, they like to keep these guys around. Uh, Kawadis have a couple of adaptations that they also use to uh, help them survive in the rainforest. You guys know what an adaptation is? No, that's all right. So an adaptation is a trait or behavior that allows the animal to survive in their uh, environment. So if you look, he has very, very long claws, which help him climb up trees. He also has something called reversible ankles. And that just basically means, if you think of a cat, they can only go head first up a tree and then they get stuck. But this guy can go head first up a tree and tail first up a tree any way he wants, uh, so he doesn't have to get stuck when he gets 100 feet up. Uh, he also has an incredible sense of smell. It's on par with the bloodhounds. And he can lift his nose 15 degrees up. So when he's sniffing through the uh, forest floor, he doesn't get sticks and dirt and leaves and bones in his uh, nose. So it's pretty cool. And uh, when kawadis were first discovered, we thought they were actually two species. Uh, females lived in large bands uh, of 15, so we call those kawadis. But the males were solitary. Do you guys know what solitary means? Yeah, by themselves, exactly. So, um, uh, like our male right here, they live by themselves in living groups. So they were called kawada mundi, which means the lonely kawadi in the native language. But through DNA testing, we found out that they're actually the same species. Uh, Kawadis only live to be about five in the wild, but in captivity they can live up to 15 years. And uh, our guy is seven. Are there any questions about the Kawadi? All right, moving on to our next side. Here comes our pair of African crested porcupines. Here they come. And they are back from Africa, uh, in the sub-Saharan part of Africa, the same place you would find lions and leopards and cheetahs and animals like that. There they are. And uh, they are the largest species of porcupine, much larger than the ones we have around here. They get up to three feet long and 50 pounds. Now let's take a quick poll. Uh, raise your hand if you think porcupines cannot shoot their tails. Raise your hand. And raise your hand if you think porcupines can shoot their tails. All right, uh, they actually cannot shoot their tails. So some of you got it. Um, porcupines can't shoot their tails like a bow from there. So if I were to go and smack the back of that porcupine, I would have a handful of tails. Uh, they do come out pretty easily and they use them for defense. They're basically a long, modified hair, but they only use them as a last resort. And that's because uh, their quills grow as fast as our hair grows. So if you think those are maybe a foot, uh, two feet long quills, it's going to take a long time for those quills to grow back. Uh, so they give a couple warning signs before they actually uh, stick their face into the, um, their quills in the face of a predator. Uh, the first thing they do is they'll puff up, kind of like what you saw when they came in the beginning, just like a dog uh, puffing up to tell the other animals to back off. The second thing they do is they start stomping their feet on the ground and uh, they start grunting, really telling the predator to really back off or else I'm going to hurt you. 
And then the last thing you do, if you can look at the tail of our porcupines, you'll see that they're kind of white and they actually have uh, hollow quills that they rattle around like a rattlesnake. So all animals in nature have learned to stay away from animals that make a rattling noise, like uh, rattlesnakes and porcupines. And then the last thing they do is they puff themselves up just a little bit bigger, and then they ram their butts into the face of a lion or a leopard or a hyena. And the animal learns never again to mess with our porcupines. Uh, porcupines mostly eat stuff that they can find on the ground. So that's uh, roots, grasses, tubers, uh, grubs, insects. And you can see right now we buried some food, so he's digging underneath the ground to find that. Uh, and these animals are uh, nocturnal. Do you guys know what the word nocturnal means? Yeah, what's nocturnal mean? Yeah, exactly. Uh, they sleep during the day and they come out at night. And that's because if you were to go to Africa, uh, to the plains, you would see that it's like 105 degrees in the, sh uh, in the shade during the day. It's really, really hot. So these guys want to avoid the heat by going into burrows during the day and they come out at night. And because of that, their eyesight is really, really awful. But they make up for that with an incredible sense of smell and an incredible sense of touch. If you can see his whiskers, they're almost as long as the rest of his body. And he uses that kind of like if we're walking around with our hands outstretched in the middle of the dark. They use them to feel uh, so they don't bump into trees, so they can find food, so they don't bump into each other, uh, stuff like that. And porcupines live to be 30 years old, which is very, very long, uh, considering that they're a rodent in the same family as squirrels and rats and mice. Are there any questions about the porcupines? All right, so we're going to move on to our next slide. And now should come our pair of uh, brown or tufted capuchin monkeys. Come on, sir. Again, our animals aren't trained, so they come out whenever they <laughs> but, uh, so I'll start off, uh, we have a pair, our female is around 30 and our male is 23. In the wild they only live to be about 20, but in captivity they can live up to 40 years. And they live in large groups dominated by the So the uh, one with the slightly broader face who's looking at you right now is our male. The slightly smaller one's the female. Uh, they live in large groups dominated by a single male and this harem of females. But when the animals get to be about 7 or 8 years old, the male kicks them out of the troop and they have to go find their own troop or they have to form their own. Uh, in the world of monkeys, there are two families. There are the New World monkeys from Central and South America and then the Old World monkeys from Africa and Asia. Uh, there's, uh, the main difference between the two is their toes and their tails. If we look at the hands of our monkey right here, you can see those hands are almost claw-like. They're very pointy at the end and they're really good at gripping. That's because these animals are considered arboreal. And arboreal just means that they like to live up in the trees. Uh, they don't spend uh, almost any time on the ground because that's where the jaguars and crocodiles and anacondas live. So they don't want to go around there. As opposed to if you were to see the paddis monkeys, which are the monkeys at the front of the zoo, you notice their hands are really like ours, really flat and broad. And that's because they spend most of their time on the ground. Older monkeys only go up in the trees to avoid a predator and to uh, get food. Uh, also, if you look at the tail of these guys or the spider monkey, you'd see that they can grab onto branches with them uh, independently of the rest of their body. We call those prehensile tails. Uh, basically, it just helps them walk around in the treetop so they don't fall out. And then uh, if you look at the Debraza monkeys, which are monkeys with the really big beards, the one with the uh, little, uh, little young one, um, you'd see that their tails are really long and flat and broad. And that's because they just help them uh, travel on the ground for balance. Uh, these guys are actually the smartest species of monkey. They're the only monkey that uses stone tools. So they've been known to crack open uh, rocks with nuts. They can also take moss and soak it up like a sponge in a river. And then they carry it around the jungle like a water bottle because at the watering hole, it's kind of dangerous. Lots of predators like to lurk around there. So they want to get out of there as quickly as possible. And then they also crush toxic millipedes and rub it all over their body like bug spray because the mosquitoes are really awful in uh, the Amazon rainforest. Uh, are there any questions about these guys? All right, moving on to our... Oh, wait one second. There they go. They might not go. Again, our animals. There they go. He just wants to... Anyway, so, as we wait for them, are there any questions about our animals while we wait? Do uh, you mean like for the show? Yeah. Yeah, so they stay out for about 10 minutes or, or 5 minutes. Oh, in the zoo, uh, all our animals come from captivity, so um, we keep them for most of their lives unless we're trying to mix up enclosures or we might uh, trade them for another animal from the zoo. Lots of times things like to do that. Or we might get them uh, people who can no longer take care of their exotic pets sometimes for us animals. Uh, we get actually our female monkey came from people uh, breed monkeys to be service animals, kind of like a service dog, and she was a former uh, breeder for them. So we get our animals from all our places.
And then, yep, uh, sometimes we give them. We try to, uh, again, with hand raising, we like to have our animals raised by their own parents, so they're not uh, messed up in their eyes. It's basically like, if we hand raised, say, an ostrich, it would be like an ostrich raising a person. You know? They wouldn't be able to function in human society. So, yeah. So, uh, out comes our next species. These are a pair of ring-tailed lemurs. You might have seen them before up in the uh, up near the duck boats. Uh, this is the offspring of the lemurs that we have up there. Uh, our species of lemur is a ring tail. And when uh, most people think of lemurs, they think of the ring tailed lemur. Do uh, you guys know the only places that lemurs are found in the wild? You guys know? Yeah. Madagascar, exactly. They live on Madagascar off the coast of Africa. It's a small island. And the reason we think that is is because if you were to go back 60 million years ago, you would see all primates. And primates is a family of animals including uh, humans, us, uh, monkeys, apes, lemurs, bush babies, uh, things called slow horses. Uh, they all would look like these. They're very primitive. Type. And what we think happened is about 60 million years ago, they got onto the island of Madagascar. Maybe they crossed the land bridge. Maybe they rafted across on big uh, leaves in the storm. Something might have happened. And uh, because there wasn't as much competition for food and there weren't as many predators, these guys got to stay in their primitive form. There wasn't as much natural selection making them faster and stronger and smarter, just like uh, on the mainland where the lemur-like animals had to evolve to become faster and become the monkeys, to become the apes, to eventually become the people that we have today. So that's why uh, they look the way they are and that's why they're such a primitive animal. Again, uh, when we think of lemurs, we usually think of the ring tails, but they're actually really, really unusual as far as lemurs go. They're the only lemurs that live in large groups, uh, they're, and they're led by a dominant female, which is unusual for any primate species. Uh, they're also very vocal. They have different calls for when a person's coming versus when a fusa, which is like a large weasel, is coming versus when a hawk's coming. And they also have something called a stink battle, which is really uh, interesting and unique. When you look at their wrists, they have a small spot right about here. And that's their scent gland, and what they do is they rub their scent gland all over their tail. And then when two lemurs are having a disagreement about something, they'll face off against each other and they'll start waving their tails at each other. Whichever lemur smells the worst and is therefore the healthiest and fittest lemur gets whatever they're fighting over. So it's a fun way of figuring out who's the boss by their smell. And that's because uh, whichever lemur smells the worst is therefore the fittest instead of them having to fight it out. That's kind of cool. Uh, lemurs uh, mostly eat plant matter, but they also eat insects, they eat sap, fruits, leaves, uh, and occasionally twigs and bugs and stuff like that. And these animals are considered an endangered species. Do you guys know what an endangered species is? What's an endangered species? Stuff that is dying. Yeah, exactly. They're dying out. And that's because mostly uh, people, uh, people hunt them in Madagascar for their meat, and it's not well regulated like it is here with uh, where we hunt turkey and deer and bear. Uh, there's no one out there to do bait wardens making sure no one's taking too many of these guys. Uh, also, uh, people cut down their habitat to make farms, which is uh, good for the people, but unfortunately not good for the leaders. And also, people capture their young and ship them off to rich Western countries like ours to sell them in the uh, black market pet trade. So, unfortunately, these guys don't do really well in houses. Although they're adorable, uh, they don't get the physical uh, stimulation they need. They don't get the mental stimulation. They don't get the food that they need. And also, they'll have sneak battles in your house, and your house will smell like lemur musk for a long time. So you definitely don't want to uh, have these guys as a pet. So if you ever get the offer, just say no, because you'll be contributing to the extinction of this awesome species. Is there any question about these guys? All right, well, thank you very much for coming, guys. Uh, you can come up and have uh, uh, take some pictures, but you guys are good to go. Thank you very much. Thank you.